All right. Uh, hi, I'm Justin Zeltzer from Z Statistics. And while usually on this channel, I'm a disembodied voice just narrating a few videos here and there. Today's a bit different. I'm coming out in front of the camera, sitting here on the couch and uh, in front of some colorful records up there to make me look more interesting than perhaps I am. But we're doing something different. It's a new video series called Fat Data and it's an exploration into that sort of world of big data we keep getting told about. You know, the one where everything you do is getting recorded, whether it's clicking on social media or using your Opal card on public transport, or even just going down to the shops and buying a four pack of gay times or whatever. It's all funneling down into a spreadsheet somewhere and some douche has to analyze it. But what for? Well, this douche hopes to find out we're going to be looking at how data can influence our understanding of social phenomena, uh, politics and sport, and also economics. And I know there are those websites like 538 and Freakonomics and stuff, but there's only so many shits I can give about Steph Curry's three point percentage. There's more stuff going on outside of that and we intend to uh, broaden the scope just a little bit beyond the United States as well. So without further ado, I give you the first video in the series and it's about something quintessentially local. And there's nothing more Australian than Crick. Chris Hemsworth. Cricket. Don't, don't worry about that. It's gonna, it's gonna be a running gag. So I'm here at the local sports ground, which is about as on location as I'm ever likely to get. But we're here to talk about the game of cricket, and in particular, the shortest form of the game of cricket. That's T20, or 20 over cricket. Um, and we know at the beginning of the game, there's a coin toss, and the captain that wins the coin toss gets to choose whether his or her team bats first. Now that all seems simple enough. But what if I told you they're consistently getting this decision wrong? And in doing so, they highlight a common problem that humans have in processing probability. Well, we're gonna be talking about that today. It's called action bias, and we'll be dealing with how it affects our decisions in both sport and life. But first up, for our North American buddies who might not be too familiar with the game, I'm gonna to introduce to you the game of cricket, the way it was introduced to me 25 years ago. So I really wasn't one of those outdoor kids, clearly. But what I lost in outdoor exercise and building friendships, I definitely gained right back in button bashing skills and uh, myopia. Yeah. All right, so first things first, the bowling team need to select a bowler. And my recommendation to be the guy with the biggest moustache, but uh, the computer here is selecting pretty stupidly. Now the bowler tries to bowl the ball into the pixelated sticks, while the batter tries to protect said sticks by wielding his bat. The bowling team then chases it down and needlessly hurls the big red diamond at the sticks. So play continues, and if the batsman actually manages to latch onto one of these bad boys and knock it across the park, well he's going to score his team some runs. Yeah, that noise. Now if the bowler manages to confuse the batsman and he goofs, hitting the ball straight to the fielder, then he's... Ouch! Yeah, okay, so that really didn't explain very much. But all you really need to know is that the teams take turns at scoring. So one team will bat first, finish up their scoring, and then the second team will try to beat the first team's score. Now, if we're up to you, would you select to bat first or bowl first? Well, we've cranked the data and there appears to be a significant advantage in bowling first, so allowing your opponent to score first. And you'd think then that at the coin toss, the captain that wins the coin toss would pretty much choose to bowl first every time, but it doesn't happen. Let's go to the data board. 
So our data set comprises of all of the T20 matches in the two biggest professional leagues in the world. That's the Indian Premier League and the Big Bash League in Australia. Now, the Indian Premier League thus far has had nine seasons since the inaugural season in 2008, and the Big Bash League has had six seasons, combining for a total of 780 games. Now, if we have a look at the number of wins to the team that bats first versus those to the team that bowls first, you can see there's already a decent discrepancy there. And if we were to calculate an odds ratio, we'd get 0 0.840. Now we're not going to get too deep into what that represents, nor the p-value, which in this case is 0 0.0082, but all you really need to know is that when this p-value gets below 0 0.05, scientists basically lose their shit. Now if you'd like to learn more about p-values, I explain it real clearly in this video that I'll put a link for right here. But the takeaway message is that there is a statistically significant advantage to bowling first. But is this message getting through? Well, looking at the decisions made by the captains when they win the coin toss, in the IPL, only 55% of the time do they elect to bowl first, which sure is a majority. But if there really was such an advantage to bowling first, surely almost every captain would elect to bowl first if they had the choice. And in the Big Bash League, it's even stranger. It's at 45%, which means that more teams are electing to bat first, giving the other team the advantage. But has this been consistent over time? Well, let's have a look at the Big Bash League first. You can see that in the very first season that 10% of captains elected to bowl first. So clearly there was this bias towards batting first. But the message seems to be getting through because in the most recent season, 2016-17, guess where it is? It's up around 80% now. So they appear to be slowly figuring this out. And if we go to the Indian Premier League, the trend is maybe not as stark, but certainly in the first few years, you can see that we're down at like 40% and 30%. We're in the most recent year, we're now up at 82%. And what's my prediction for this year? Well, you heard it here first. I reckon in both leagues, we're going to be up around 90% plus as more analysis like this becomes known. Now you might be thinking, well, does this effect hold with any other forms of the game? Well, just to do my due diligence, I checked out One Day Internationals as well, which is the 50 over form of the game. And for all the games we've had since 1971, again, guess what? We've found that teams that bowl first tend to win more, with the odds ratio here being 0.942. Now this is not as strong a result as what we saw in the T20. But realistically, we probably wouldn't be expecting such a strong result. Why? Well, in one day internationals, it's much more likely to get imbalanced teams playing each other. So a very good team or a very good country playing a very bad team. And when that happens, it adds a lot of noise to our data because it doesn't really matter who bowls or bats first in those situations. A huge cricketing nation like Pakistan is always gonna thrash a small minnow like say Nepal. But even with that noise in our data here, we get a p-value of 0.0357, which again, is below that magical 0.05 figure. And if this low p-value can persist, even in the presence of this noise in the data set, there's got to be an advantage to bowling first. But, no surprise, when we have a look at the decision-making when teams are choosing to bat or bowl, it's still only at 47% more teams are still electing to bat than they are to bowl. But if we look at it by year from the year 2000, you can see it peaks at about 60% in the year 2013, but now we've dipped again in the most recent year so that we're just above 40%. So despite this evidence we've gleaned from basic statistical analysis, teams seem to have this bias for batting first. Now in a game where the objective is to score more runs than your opponent, it appears almost counterintuitive to let your opponent score first. We kind of feel this draw towards action. And maybe that's due to nervous energy before the game. And it could also be due to this old cricket adage, which says that if you bat first, you bat freely. You don't really have to worry about what your opponent's doing. You just kind of play your natural game. But I think the data that we have here is starting to contradict that strategy. This article describes a concept called action bias which might explain our cricketer's impulse to want to bat first. 
In the article, though, it suggests for goalkeepers in a penalty shootout, the best strategy is actually to stay right in the middle and not dive one way or the other. But how many goalkeepers are going to do that? It seems to go against their natural impulse to want to do something. Now, it's not just in sport where action bias rears its head. Uh, also in other arenas, poker players, for example, uh, if you have a couple of poor hands in a row, you're going to be spurred towards action, towards betting on a particular hand, even if it's strategically disadvantageous to do so. Um, also, in finance, financial managers are often faced with the conundrum of having stocks that are going wildly up and wildly down, and even though the strategy might be to hold the line, it's very difficult to do so, and they're often spurred into action. This article calls it do somethingism, which is a term that's definitely going to get another run here on Fat Data. Um, think about the political process too. In most modern democracies these days, we've got the left-leaning party following the right-leaning party, following the left-leaning party again. It's almost like we have this collective feeling of do somethingism or action bias, right? But you might be thinking it's not really all that life-threatening though, is it this action bias? Well, it could be. So I took my camera down to the pub to have a chat with my mate, Dr. Andrew Levine, about this concept of action bias in the world of medicine, or as they call it, intervention bias. Andy is a veterinary surgeon, and he's been treating your pets for the last decade. So how would you describe intervention bias? I think intervention bias would refer to when a doctor, surgeon, medical practitioner, um, <clears throat> tries to intervene, whether that's a diagnostic test or does a surgery or treats a patient when maybe the same or better outcome would have happened without doing anything. So it happens both in people medicine and also in animal medicine. Yeah, I, I think it's huge. Um, I think it's probably underreported and under-recognised. Well, doing a little research of my own, I'm starting to think that Andy's right. There have been many articles citing this issue of action bias in medical interventions. And so it seems like this could be a really big issue. Professor Ian Harris certainly thinks so. He's an orthopedic surgeon whom, coincidentally, I've had the pleasure of writing a few papers with. But his book, called Surgery, The Ultimate Placebo, came out last year and deals specifically with this concept of intervention bias. So I asked Andy why surgeons of all stripes are biased towards action. Unfortunately, a lot of medical practitioners are on commission um, throughout both medic, human and veterinary medicine. Oh, so they're incentivized to perform interventions. Um, in the veterinary, in America, for example, many veterinarians are on 20 to 25 percent of the surgical fee that they charge they get in their pocket. Wow. So they're incentivized to intervene. So, whether it's in sport or finance or even medicine, it appears that humans are biased towards action. So what's the moral of the story? Well, when you're faced with a decision, I reckon it's always best to do your homework, take your time, and always check your stats. I'm Justin Zeltzer, thanks for watching. Big, big thanks also to Andrew Levine for joining us, and Justin Bobbin and Bradley Wong for some choice ideas as well. If you want to make a comment about some ideas you might have for subsequent shows, leave it down there in the comments, or you can connect with the show in any of these ways. No ball. No ball. No ball. No ball. No ball. No ball.